Last week we did a really odd study on the on numbers of what the Bible says about time, on what the Bible says about uh, God's calendar. We started in Genesis and went all the way through the Bible and examined numbers, examined how they connect to prophecy, how they connected to what God said all the way from the example that he said to look back from the beginning and he separates the end from the beginning and the things like that. And so I want to continue this subject because what we're doing is we're doing a study on questions about end times. That's what we're doing, questions about end times. So we broke this down in the four studies. The first one that we did uh, is we just answered the question, what does the Bible say about Christians going through their tribulation period? I did that at the beginning because of the fact that there were so many people that were saying, I think we're in it and this has begun. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, let's see what the Bible actually says about that to know where we're at. And then the second question that we, get, uh, that we got into is, is, are we living in the end times? And, and we, there, there was, I was just trying to take solid questions or uh, solid responses that the Bible talks about. So I'll give you guys the ones that we've done so far. I won't elaborate on them because we have plenty of content to get into tonight. So number one, we, we uh, are living in the end times. We know this because we live in the days of multiplied sin. It's what Jesus said. Number two, we live in the days of the great falling away. And I'm not just saying that because people can just say we live in a day of great falling away. If you look at the stats of Christianity, of church, uh, news things, all that other stuff, you can see there's a drastic falling away from truth, God's word. And we tied that into what the Bible says in the days of Sodom, in the days of Noah, those kind of things that you'd see that men were uh, pleasing themselves and turning from God and, and doing everything that was right in their own eyes. But we also know this because we can see it from the concept of time that God has established. And we, we went through and we studied that. What does the Bible say about time? What does the Bible say about the calendar? How does these things add up? And so that's some of the things that we were talking about just a minute ago. But tonight we're going to get into one that we kind of touched on last week. And the, the question came up, but I, I said we'll address this next week. And that is, we know from the signs concerning Israel. And this is a fascinating subject, and I, I, the more I got into these, I could have gotten off on all these rabbit trails, uh, because there's so many fascinating aspects of this. So I want you guys to do this with me tonight. So take your Bibles, if you will, to start with me. And we, of course, in this kind of study of doing like a, a, a doctrinal study, it's more of a topical study. So we end up bouncing around to different places. But I want to take you back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The verses will be on the screens behind me as well, and uh, you'll be able to follow along that way. But I want to give you background to Israel, because of the fact is, just to say, watch Israel doesn't make sense if you don't understand why we're watching Israel. We, we have to understand why God said that he's pointing us to this. So uh, we think of Israel as just part of the Old Testament. When you think about that, you think of God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham had Isaac and Jacob and, you know, the 12 tribes and all that other stuff. But it goes deeper than that. Uh, it tells us a lot about the, the character of God. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and we're just giving background. Right now, we're not even getting into the prophecy aspect of it. We've got to build up to that. Now, the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and unto the land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless thee, that, or bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I, I want to point out things just because of the fact is you can sit there and say, well, that's pretty cool. God promised blessings. Let me tell you how amazing this prophecy was and how amazing these promises were that God said. And did God bless us through the Jews? You say, well, how many blessings do we get from the Jews? Oh my goodness, let me begin. Number one, God gave us Jesus Christ through the Jews. We have salvation because of the fact that God gave this promise to the Jews. And we, we know that from following the lineage and, and people say, what was, what was Jesus? What was nationality was Jesus? Jesus was clearly a Jew. He was born into that family. He was born into that nation. He, he, is, a, he is a Jew. Uh, you say, could it get better than that? Well, let me tell you how cool this gets. God also gave us his word through the Jews. If you go through the authors of the books of the Bible, they were Jews. 
God used them as his people to give us one of the most precious, amazing things that we have. And the Bible said at the end of that, and all the worlds or all the families shall be blessed from that. We're blessed today because of God using them and said, I'm going to use your seed, use your family to give blessings. But God also birthed the church through the Jews. If you go to Acts chapter 1 and 2, we see how God used those people and they stood there on the day of Pentecost and preached the gospel. And from that, we have the book of Acts. And of course, later we read in how the Gentiles were pulled into that. Gentiles meaning anybody that's not a Jew was pulled into that. But we see that. We could go on and on. But I want you to see when God said, I have big plans for the Jewish people to bless people, God meant that and God actually did that. But God made a promise to the Jews. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. Now listen to this. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, literally generations is promised to him of this, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So this, there's a lot that God's saying through this. He made promises. And you say, why is that a big deal? Because through the character of God and through the stories of the Old Testament, we learn the character of God to understand that God keeps his promises. If we don't have promises being fulfilled of that, then we don't understand how powerful that is. When God says that he keeps his promises, this is, a, this is an extreme illustration of this, and this is where a lot of the prophecy comes into this. Num- two things that God said about Israel in this passage. Number one, Israel is a people. Israel is a people. Number two, Israel is a land. He didn't just make the promise to the people or the seed of Abraham. He made the promise to the nation or the land mass, the literally dirt mound that's over in the Middle East. God made a promise that that land will be your land. It's called the promised land. We teach that to kids in junior church. God gave a promised land. It is the promised land of God. Literally mean that God put a promise on it that he said it will be an everlasting possession. It will be yours. Now we sit back and scratch our heads going, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Wait, did God keep his promises through all that? How does that add up into this? But he said an everlasting possession. But God also warned his people with this. You realize that there's consequences to sin and there's obedience that we're to follow. God warned his people to stay faithful to him. So, just keep going. We're just giving you a history lesson as we go through this. this is what we're doing. Deuteronomy 28, 63. And I love this because I'm telling you, this is biblical history. This is prophecy. This is Old Testament survey. There's so many things that we're getting out of this study. So even if somebody said, I'm not into end time prophecy, that's okay. If you're into the Bible, you're into this because it's all good. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 28:63. And it shall come to pass that the Lord rejoice over you to do you good and to multiply you. So the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you. So he's drawing a comparison. And he literally said, God made you a promise. He's going to do good to you. He's going to multiply you. He's going to protect you. But also, if you don't put God first and you don't make him your God and you run off and do your own thing, you worship other gods and go after that. We see examples of that through Scripture. He said, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you as well, to bring you to naught. It shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. He said, it's going to be a choice. The blessings and, 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 and the, the goodness of God comes from obedience of God. This is what would happen. Verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all the people from the one end of the earth even to the other. Now think about this. This is what God said that he would do. And when we look at a history today, you're going, oh wow, God actually said that back in Deuteronomy when he was telling them all this. From one end of the earth even to the other. And there shall thou serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. And I can't wait to get into some of that stuff as as we get through this. They would be scattered. And this is exactly what happened to Israel. It's exactly what happened to Israel. 
keeps going, verse 65, and among these nations shalt thou find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee their trembling heart and a failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. It won't be easy. See, there's, there's a choice that we can have, and God promised the land of Canaan that floweth with milk and honey, and he promised them. And then he said, but the other way of doing your own thing and, and, and sinning and rejecting God and all those things, he said, trembling heart, failing eyes, sorrow of mind, he said, you'll have this. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have no assurance of thy life. You say, what does that look like? Now, now we, we're, most of you guys probably have gone through school and history and things like that. So let's draw some of the comparison. When he was saying this, that their, their life shall hang in doubt and all these other things, fear day and night. Do we know the oppression that's been put on the Jews directly? You think about the attack on the Jews with the Holocaust. Think about all of history and of all the things that could have happened and about the fact that that landed on the Jews Six million European Jews were murdered. Six million Jews murdered from 1941 to 1945. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., you've been through probably the Holocaust Museum. I've done it a number of times when I was on vacation. And it brings to mind the oppression, the attack that was on the Jewish people. How they were targeted in that way. Why? Because of Israel's sin, because they, 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 they had faced so much opposition, because God was their protection. God said, as long as my hand is on you. And I think a lot of the lessons that we should learn from this is the fact that when we look at America, it should wake us up to understand we're not great and good and blessed because we deserve it. We're great and good and blessed because we, we serve the God that is great and good and blessed us. That's, that's why we have what we have. And the Bible is very clear. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Jesus spoke of this. We're just going through this timeline, okay? It says in, in Luke 21, 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. He said this is going to happen. This is the prophecy dating all the way back to the Roman rule. So the Gentiles is what he's talking about. The non-Jews, the ones that weren't given the promise of this, would tear down and take over for a season of time is what he said. And Jesus told them that this would happen. Even goes into the destruction of the temple. Jesus says in Mark 13, 2. And Jesus answered and said, Seest thou these great buildings? He's standing there in front of these great buildings. And he says this, There shall not be left one stone upon the other that, thou shalt be th- uh, that it shall be thrown down. Now, here's the crazy thing. 37 years later from that moment, that's exactly what happened. And around uh, 70 AD, the Romans came in and tore everything apart. And and we, we see all these things that would happen, and all of a sudden, Israel, that was so great of a nation, began to be ripped down and tore apart. But you say, why? This was all part of prophecy. It's what God said. Israel was completely changed from this moment. Today, we see the evidence of this. And I'm in a connect the dots and to be honest I am not the right guy to be teaching this lesson is for I'm not a Jewish scholar and I don't know the history and all that other stuff you know what I'm saying it's, it's just not my niche if, if I'm being honest I love the Bible I love history I love connecting the dots but I'm, I'm sure there's some historians that could just go so deep into this but I'll do my best today there's evidence when the Jews gather to pray and we know this because we see this in movies we see this on tv we see this in news where do they go to pray They go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. They go into the Wailing Wall. So we see these pictures of the Wailing Wall. I don't know how many people fully put the the dots together of what the Wailing Wall is. Why do they go to this wall? Why is it there they're not going to the temple? Why are they not doing all these things that they used to do? Because it was destroyed. So you know where they go? They go to the western wall of the Temple of Solomon and they worship at the very remnants of what's left. And that is that outer, that wall that's left to the side. And that's all the Jews have left. It's literally rubble. It's all they have left. There's no more of the temple. It's completely destroyed. But in the outside of it, there's a wall there that retained the outer parts of that. And now the Jews go to that and they pray and they wail over, over the loss. They wail over what they don't have. 
They, they write down prayers and they stick them in the, the crevices and the cracks of that wall. That's what they do in the, in the midst of all that. Have you ever known what's on the other side of this? this is, and, and, I, and I know some of you are like, I know all this, but let me just fill in the blanks as we go. Do they go to this wall? The wall is the Dome of the Rock. I started asking people, how many people know what the Dome of the Rock is? How many people in here would say, I know what the Dome of the Rock represents? All right, so here's the thing. The Dome of the Rock is not part of the Jews. That is a Muslim shrine. Now, if you look at the picture, look at where the temple was. Look at the wailing wall of where they're going to pray, lowered down on that other side of that. And then you look over the top, and you see built in 691 AD was a Muslim shrine. And inside of that, you talk about the, the Dome of the Rock or that rock that was at there or the, uh, that, that was built over that stone in the middle of the city of Jerusalem where they claim the false prophets that we know, the false prophet Muhammad, that claimed to stand on that stone and was ascended up into heaven. And we sit there and say, false prophet, yes. Anybody that claims to do what Jesus did is a false prophet. There's only one person that ascended up into heaven to be the Son of God, and that was Jesus Christ. But I tell you, Satan loves to replicate everything that Jesus Christ does and put in a false representation of that. He is a deceiver, he is a liar. And upon what God built up and God made a promise and God established in the middle of that that was ripped down and built up in the middle of that instead is this giant, literally, symbol of Israel that's not even a symbol of God. Just keep that in mind as we go through this. I just, it just As we're talking and going back through all these things and putting the pieces together. So keep this in mind, especially when we start talking about the Jews coming back to Jerusalem for the next 1,900 years after Jerusalem was overtaken, the temple was destroyed, the Romans busted in in 70 AD, for the next 1,900 years, no Israel. Not, not like we know it. Some of the people remained in the land, yes, but it was a small remnant. When we talk about the remnant in the Bible, we talk about those words, it was a small remnant that remained. Most of them were scattered especially if, if you look at history and things like that, uh, I think it was even recently, 40% of the Jews that live in the world are, are represented in America. Not in Israel, not in Jerusalem. So, are we living in the end times? I gave you a lot of history to go back to that. You can say, what does that have to do with pr pr uh, prophecy? That's the background of it, so you have to understand what's going on right now. So, I said this, we can know from the signs concerning Israel. So, let's get into that. God promised he would regather the people from the nations. God promised. It was part of what he said that he would do. You know why he, God said that? Because God is faithful and God keeps his promises. That, that should stir us up as we're reading this and you're going, why would God do that? Why out of everything that Israel has done, why would God do that? And I'm going to give you the solid reason because God keeps his promises. Man does it. Man fails. Man messes up. This was a promise, but it was also part of end time prophecy. God prophesied that he would also return them to their land to show his faithfulness of what God promised to do. Because so much happens with Israel. And we, if, you, if you were to go to the book of Revelation and you start flipping through what happens during the tribulation period and, and you see Israel and you see what's happening and you see what's going on during those seven years and all that stuff, you're thinking, how can that be possible when Israel is not a nation when Jerusalem's not the capital, and when the people don't live there. So in this generation, in this generation, it is a nation. They are being called back, and the capital is restored. All in our generation. Let's look at some prophecies. Let's look at this. Joel 2.31, all the way from there, begins the prophesy of this coming. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. Now, I didn't do a lot of research because that was not on the agenda of what I was trying to go with this. There, the moon turned to blood is talking about the solar eclipses where it's blocked out. It creates that effect. In 2014 and 2015, there were four of these blood moons. Four falling in during the exact time of the Jewish feast. You say that's a coincidence. There are no coincidences when you're talking about the word of God and how things line up. God is a God of timing. Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. So we're talking about the end. We're talking about the 
great tribulation period, especially the last three and a half years, especially about the battle of Armageddon that happens at the last bold judgments that happen in the book of Revelation. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. We see that in the book of uh, Revelation when the two prophets come and they're preaching and then they're, they're talking about repentance that should come. And we're talking about the Israel and the promises of Israel. For in the Mount Zion in Jerusalem shall be delivered and the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So he's speaking, literally, Joel is talking all the way back and speaking to the end times. He's speaking of what's to happen before then. But then you start scratching your head saying, wait a minute, in order for that to happen, there had to be a lot of things to happen before then. That's why it's so exciting when we saw what happened with the restoration of Israel and all these things. Man, that, that ought to make our hearts jump to say, wow, all of this is lining up exactly like God said that it, sh- it should happen. Uh, Joel 3 verse 1, for behold, in those days and in that time. Now, I, I love the fact that I can point that out because last week we were talking about God is a God of time. And God is, that points to these things and specific about what happens. When I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That is Jehovah will judge. That's what that means. God's going to bring them down to the valley. God's going to line them up against his people. God's going to do that. And he said this, in that valley, God will judge. God will judge. You say, why is God going to do that? Well, I will plead with them for, their, for my people and for my heritage, Israel. I will set the record straight. I will come down on them. I will correct whom have scattered among the nations and parted my land. You talk about what Armageddon in is. It's not just the end of the tribulation period. It is God fulfilling what he said that he would do, that he would be their king, that he would correct, that he would be there, that would fight for them. And of course, we know how Armageddon ends with God coming back with the sword in his mouth and with the word of God. And he strikes the nations down and all those things that happen. God promises to bring judgment on them in those last days in the battle of Armageddon for the way that they treated his land and the way that he treated his people. That's what it says in there. This is leading them all up to the end, but God promised to return the people to their land. This is where it gets good. This is where the application comes to this. This is not something we read into. I want to prove to you guys as I read the prophecy of this that this is something that is so clear because I've heard a lot of things said in Scripture that scratches your head and you think, man, that's kind of a stretch, man. Yeah, I'm sure some of you guys have been like that. I've heard prophecy stuff and I scratch my head and think, man... That took a lot to kind of draw those conclusions. I'm going to give you one of those myself when we get here in a little bit. That, you know, it's just, it's, it's a Tony doctrine, not a Bible doctrine. I'll give you one of those. Uh, this is something that we're not reading into. I'm going to read this so clear as we go through that, that it's going to make sense. Deuteronomy 30, verse 3. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee. You say, what is the motive of God doing this? Because he loves them. You say, why is God good to us? Because he loves us. And will return and gather thee from all the nations, whether the Lord thy God has scattered thee. So what did God say? I'm going to go to all the nations and gather them back and bring them back into his nations. That's what he said. There were millions of Jews in other countries, including the U.S. Millions of Jews. Ezekiel 34, verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that amongst his sheep that are scattered, and I will seek out my sheep and deliver them out of the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day, and I will bring them out from thy people and gather them from countries, and I will bring them to their own land. Am I reading into anything? I mean, you say, what is he saying? It's as clear as day as he says this. And feed them among the mountains of Israel by the rivers and the inhabited places of the country. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. And I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of the, all the countries and bring you into your own land. That's what he said. Isaiah eleven eleven, And it shall come to pass that in that day the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people and shall be left from Assyria and Egypt and Paphros and Cush and Elam and Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. 
I could go on and on and on. You talk about something that God clearly said in the Old Testament that is going to happen. God said, my people would be scattered. The temple will be torn apart. They will be all over the land. I will bring them back together and I will assemble them in their land as them being their people. In order for this to happen, Israel had to reclaim their land because you know over in the Middle East, it is chaos. It is war. You say, why is that? If you were to study the Old Testament, go back through history of all the times that Lot's children slept with them and all that, you know, you, you see all the sin that happened and it, it bred sin and you have all these wicked nations that rose up against God and worshiped idols and all the idolatry and stuff like that. They, they created it themselves when you talk about a lot of the uh, enemies that they had. But on May 14th, 1948, Israel became a state again for the first time in 2,000 years. And by the way, let me remind you, when we're talking generations, that lands within generations. U.S. President Harry Truman was one of the determining votes that was on the U.N. vote when they gathered together with the United Nations to vote. Shows them coming together to vote as a nation. They voted and it happened. History was made in a day. Prophecy was fulfilled in a day. In that moment. Now for us, we sit there and say, Israel, we, we, don't, we don't fully comprehend this. I mean, obviously, we can go back in history. We see the, 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 the doctrines of this and the verses and things like that. But you think about it being your people and something seeming to be impossible when you are not only a minority, when your nation is not a, a huge army at that time, and all the other things that would take to necessitate that happening, and you're saying, how in the world would this ever be possible? And then all of a sudden, God did it in a moment. Brought them back, made the rule, reestablished them as a nation. A nation was reborn in a day. So you hear prophecy of things like this. Can you imagine being the Jewish people? hearing the promises of God, and them looking around going, but there is absolutely no way. There's no way. There's just no way. We can't fight for it. We, we have no money. We, there, there's just no way. And then God did it. And you stop and you think, how is this possible? Let me give you another prophecy from the Old Testament. Isaiah 66 verse 8 who hath heard such a thing, who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? Yes, with God and only God. See, on this day, 2,500-year-old prophecy was fulfilled. And yes, there was dancing in the streets because they saw God at work. But again, it did not create real peace. It didn't create real peace. Because of the fact is that the pal uh, Palestine and everybody else that's in those neighboring countries, everybody's fighting for that little piece of land. It, it's, there, there's always been opposition against Israel because of the fact that it is God's people and the fact that God gave them this sliver of land on, on the giant globe and the fact that Satan hates anything that is God's. There's always been opposition. But this led the, the Arabs to, and the nations around them to war to defend what they wanted to have. Since then, they have witnessed a, a number of peace treaties. And you saw on the video, maybe you didn't notice that, but to, even the, the uh, leadership of President Clinton was part of that, signing peace treaties. And even the Bible even says they will declare peace, peace. And you say, with, with wars, rumors of wars and all that, if you funnel that into what we're talking about in, in respects of what the Bible says of prophecy and what's going on in history, not just randomly saying peace, but understanding what they were fighting for, what had to be put in place, and what was Satan was fighting against. I don't really think we fully understand this. And the only, the only illustration that I could give you, and this even kind of stirs up a, a, a sore spot amongst uh, our nation and things with this, would be the illustration of it coming to uh, Native Americans in uh, America. If all at once, if we were to go back and tell the Native Americans that we're giving you America back, and all of a sudden they turned the land over and they became the possession and the rulers of it, you say, how would that happen? There's such a small amount of people and there's such a great nation and so much opposition. That couldn't happen. That's the comparison of this. 
But only that is a more likely comparison because of the fact is when the Jews did this, they were scattered all over the world. So it wasn't even like this mighty nation of people in one location. They were scattered all over the place. Hence how we had the Holocaust and all the other things that came into play. But not only this is part of prophecy, but this is part of the promise that God promised them to return them to their land. In 2006, history was made again. You say, I don't know of 2006 being the history of anything that happened when it comes to this, because we know these things. See, it was in 2006 that history was made for the first time in 1900 years. Israel became home to the largest Jewish community in the world. There were so many people that came back to Israel in 2006. How many of you remember 2006? Okay, hopefully most of you guys, unless there's kids in here. I'm trying to prove a point. (laughs) This is our generation. I'm not talking. I mean, sometimes we show videos like that. You go, man, that's so far removed from me. 2006, Israel, after 1900 years, Israel had more people back in their country than any other nation in the world. To give you a comparison, it started back in 1948 when Israel became a state or a nation again. 65 or 650,000 Jews were in Israel. Today, Jewish population is somewhere around 6 million. 6 million. I saw an article on this dispatch a number of years ago. I thought I saved it. I can't find it. I wish I did. And I was flipping through there, and one of the pages on there had this thing, and it was literally said, Israel calls the people back. And it wasn't even a Christian thing. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like somebody trying to prove a point that it does what the Bible says. It was Israel calling their people back, and it showed all the incentives that they were doing to be able to bring their people back to where they belong in their nation. The big question is why? Why all this? You see, in Amos 9.14, and I will bring again the captivity of the people of Israel, and they will build waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and drink of the wine thereof, and they shall make all, uh, gardens, and eat of the fruit thereof, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled out of their land, which uh, I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. God said, I'm going to do this. I made a promise, and I'm going to let all the world see how I'm going to do something to prove this to them. This continues in 2017. In 2017, the United States helped Jerusalem become their first official capital, which was moved to Israel. Which is, and if you go back through Clinton, Obama, and all that, Reagan and Bush, and all them, that's always been in the talks of the works. But it actually came to reality in 2017. You say, why does this matter? I, I, I did a lot of, re- and, and again, there, there, there's so much politics involved in this that it just scratched my head. And I'm thinking, why does that even matter? I go back to the fact that uh, in the Palestinians in, in Jerusalem, there's like 40% of the nation of there is them. So you start going through with the Arab nations being involved in God's land. And all of a sudden, the, the capital city or the, the ruler or the authority of that gets placed back in Jerusalem, who is the, which is known as the most holy city in the world. You go back to where the Dome of the Rock is. You go back to where Muhammad, which is the Muslim religion is, that is all over the, the world, not just America, all over the world. And all of a sudden, now you have this conflict. And I wanted so bad, uh, the videos that we show, we have to get copyright permission, and we did for this one, but I couldn't for the other one. It was, it was a newscast. And the newscast came in, and they're interviewing all the people in Jerusalem, asking, what do you think of this? And they said, you understand that now in Israel, I wish I could show this to you, now in Israel, I'm a Muslim, but I am a second-class citizen. This is no longer my land. This is no longer my place. Now I am, I am a foreigner in my own land. I have a business. I have a family and all this. And they said, and then they showed in this news thing how the number one, the Jewish religion, the Jewish beliefs are now becoming priority and mandatory over everything else. What is God doing? He's reestablishing them in their land as his people once again. This is causing and stirring great conflict in the Middle East. And you say, why would they not be happy for the fact that this happened? If you watch the news and look up any articles, there's no joy with this. I mean, they're literally in turmoil over this. And that is why. But do we see how amazing this is? Have you ever thought in Christian history, biblical history, going back, of everything that the Jews have gone through, 
If you go back through their history, the fact that they should have been obliterated, they should be gone. We shouldn't be talking about Jews right now. Think about the opposition. Think about the small nation in which they rule. Think, think about the, the, the fact of them being pushed out of that. How many times do you run into somebody that's a Moabite, an Edomite, the Amorites, the Hittites, all the neighboring countries that were at war with them? And of course, they've migrated into different peoples and things like that, but you don't find that history of them there like you do when you come to the Jewish people. Because of the fact is that God made them a promise. They go back because the world ends with the battle of Armageddon. In Zechariah 12 verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. That's God's people, God's place, all the things we're talking about, and especially the things that we see in the news. And in that day... I will make Jerusalem burdensome stone for all the people. All that burden themselves with, uh, with it shall be cut into pieces, though all the people of the earth shall be gathered together against it. And what is that? That is the great day of the Lord. When God brings down the hammer on this of what he said. So the only way that can happen is to see everything that we see in history right now being fulfilled before our eyes. We actually have, you know, like the video clips that we see and be able to witness this for ourselves. We're we're seeing this happening in in today's technology and things like that that is happening. So, what's next? When you come to this, I just tell you, you can read your Bible and watch the news at the same time. And any time Israel is mentioned... I would perk up and listen to what it has to say because I promise you it has everything to do with God's promises, has everything to do with the tribulation period, had everything to do with the great uh, coming uh, of Christ at the end, the great uh, tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, all those things, has everything to do with these things. So it's not, you can literally see as it's all coming together, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled before our eyes. Now you think about in Revelation when it talks about the, the Antichrist and all those things, it talks about the Antichrist will desecrate the holy temple. You say, well, there's no holy temple to, for him to go in and do that. And where is the holy temple supposed to be built? Where the Dome of the Rock is. So now you can see why there is so much conflict in there. So, so we can sit on the edge of our seats and go, huh, I wonder what's going to happen. You know, we're, we're, we're watching this because all these things have to come to pass and we're watching for these things to happen. So I'm going to give you one last point, and this is really just seed for thought, just because I think it's cool. And I want to give you one more point, and then we'll be done with the idea of how do we know we're living in the last days. Here's number five, and this is we can know from the technology pieces being put into place. And I won't spend a long time on this, but I put this just to show that it, once again, all these things, when I talked about last week, when we talked about the God's calendar and the timing of things and stuff like that, and then we added up the 6,000 years and the 1,000 millennial reign and the fact that God gave us those numbers in the Bible, you say, oh, that's all around our generation. And then when you look at what's going on with Israel, oh, wow, that's all our generation. And then when you see what's going on with these next things, you go, oh, wow, again, that's all our generation. The disciples thought that maybe Jesus would return in their day and age. But if you were to read the Bible, you would think, huh, that would have been impossible. There's some things that wouldn't have been because there's always been sin. There's always been sickness. There's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. There's always been all those things. But even then, we kind of connected the dots of what those things actually mean. But there's also been things that did not make sense. So I'm going to read you a passage in Revelation. And this is something that's prophecy that's going to happen in the future. And the Bible says, after the prophets are the preach for that time, declaring the name of the Lord, and they killed them because of the fact that they were preachers and doing that, and the fact that the city was so wicked. The Bible says, and their bodies shall lie in the street, in the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. And they, the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, shall see their dead bodies three and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because of these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now, just to kind of give you a recap of what's going on, when we go into this and in some of the coming lessons, some of this will make sense. But they will kill two witnesses that preach before the people. Why do they do that? Well, it's said in the scriptures because they tormented them. 
Now, honestly, I mean, I, I, maybe people have thought that about me preaching that lasted forever. We were hungry. He wouldn't stop. It was torture. I don't know. But this was literally because of the fact is that he's going to be talking about their sin. He's going to be talking about judgment of God. And in their eyes, they're going to be, I just wish they would shut up. I mean, literally. And the fact that they killed them, their torture that they're talking about is literally that they had two prophets preaching about sin. And when they die, they will celebrate and dance and party over the death of two preachers that were preaching the truth. Very morbid. And the thing is that I want to point out is who is saying this. And the Bible is very descriptive of this. Revelation 9, 11, 9, I'll read this again. And of the people, and of kindreds, and of tongues, and of nations, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. I'm going to ask you guys, in the day of, you, you name it, uh, D.L. Moody, in the day of, you could keep going back through history, how in the world would that have been possible? He said, when I, they, they were preaching, the Lord is going to come. How would this happen? I have no idea. I have no idea how that would happen. Now, I'll ask you guys today, in our technology day, how would that happen? Satellites, cable TV, YouTube, smartphones, social media. I mean, internet, all this other tub, Hulu, Netflix, all, all the technology that we'd have. Now we have the technology that people, as soon as it happened, it would hit news and it would be global through Facebook Live and, you know, Instagram Live and all those other things that we have. All those things would happen just like that. And the whole world would see their dead bodies simultaneously laying in the streets of that. I told you guys I'm going to throw out my own little doctrinal assumption. Can I do that? Just something? And I think when I read stuff like that and I think, what in the world would that mean? You know, because it doesn't make sense in our culture. And they make Mary, verse 10, and they make Mary, and they shall send gifts one to another. And I thought, they're, they're, they're using technology to send uh, these pictures and the images all over. And the Bible says in the middle of it, they're going to send these gifts one to another. And I thought, when we party and do something, we're not sending, you know, candles across the country to each other. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we, we do some things like that. For the most part, we don't. But I thought, even in our culture, I wonder if that would acknowledge if gifts were talking about like GIFs. How many of you guys know what a GIF is? Okay, uh, okay, it's it's a it's a thing that people send on their cell phones of a cartoon thing to mock or to celebrate or to poke or whatever at another person. And I thought, even with that, if that's one of those things, and it says, "and, and they shall be merry and shall send gifts one to another." Now, I'm not saying that that's what it is, but I'm just thinking the application of something like that makes sense. Did you see this video? Oh, they're finally dead. Oh, we don't have to hear them anymore. And they're sending these one to another. This goes on. Verse, uh, chapter uh, 13, verse 16 is another one aspect of this. And he causes all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, right there, a lot of people get on the edge of their seat and go, aha, uh -huh, I know what this, you know, because this is a touchy thing. This is, everybody's like wondering about this. This isn't the lesson that I want to get into because that comes in the next lessons that I'm going to do because I'm going to build a timeline of uh, a revelation of this. So I want to do it now. What I'm trying to prove is the technology aspect of what's going on, pointing to the coming of Christ. This is talking about the mark of the beast, but we will get into greater detail later of what this means and what it doesn't mean. Because it drives me crazy to th see people posting things and I'm like, they said, I believe it's this. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's impossible. It doesn't line up with scripture. That's why we have the Bible. So we know what it is and what it's not. But it is, has been our generation that has seen the technology to make this very, uh, very possible. See, the technology has advanced around the world uh, in, in such a way that they didn't even have the ways to do this before. Perfect illustration, and I've given this before. If you've ever seen the movie A Thief in the Night, uh, when I saw it when I was a kid, it scared me to death. It absolutely scared me to death. It is an older movie made about the coming of Christ. Now, if you watched it today, it would be a comedy because of the fact is it is so outdated and so cheesy and, and what they thought. 
But one of the things that they thought that no man is going to buy or sell because that was during the time of the rise of stores having barcodes. Boop, you know, like sitting there. So they literally thought that it was going to be the mark would be some sort of barcode and scanning and things like that, which made sense. But even then, there would have been some sort of global way to track it. But now when we think about what we have, the reality of that is we have direct deposit, debit cards, PayPal, credit cards that you can literally tap. Not, not scan anymore. You just tap it on something. And within seconds, it's on my cell phone explaining where I sent it, what I spent it on, and a record of it that gets deducted out of my account. Online banking, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, cash apps on our cell phones, all those things. You sit there and understand, we already live in a cashless society. Uh, it's, it's just part of it. And you say, how would the world adapt to something like this? Let me give you some illustrations that are applicable to even our society today. Number one, disease. Number one, disease. And the Bible talks about that there would be birth pains. Literally, the closer we get to the end, the more the world is going to feel the pressure and feel the sin of, uh, of that. We're going to feel the birth pains of it because of the fact that it's coming to the end. The, the, the nine months of labor is over. over. You're now you're in the birth pains of it, and the, we're, we're going to feel those things. But I, I was going to a store and walking in, and I saw this sign that said, no cash accepting. You guys have probably seen that at the, some of the things. I'm like, did, did it, as a Christian, you're going, huh, that's weird. I know you can go up to the machines and it says we're not accepting cash at this because the, the cash readers. But to, re, to, to go through a time, a period of time where they're literally saying this. And then I saw where when the coronavirus first started over in China, one of the ways that they were extinguishing out the disease, they were burning the money. Because the fact is the money exchange and people having the germs and, and buying things, whatever. And so the, one of the easiest things they were doing Anyways, it's just one of the things that is going to be slowly to the demise of money. Number two, another way is that they would fix identity theft. You realize in our culture, one of the greatest threats to mankind of, of crimes is not having somebody break into your house or steal hot, you know, hot wire your car and steal it. That's not at the top of the list. It's cyber crimes or it's identity theft. Every year, approximately 10 million Americans become victims of identity theft. The problem has grown by over 800% in the last 10 years. And you say, why are you saying this? Because of the fact is, when it comes down to it, of the time of accepting some sort of mark, it will be to fix a problem. Because right now, if everybody lined up in the straight, or they, we were called down to the Capitol building, that you had to put out your hand or the back of the head, nobody would do it. You know what I'm saying? But Satan is much more sly than that. You know what I'm saying? He's sneaky. It's going to be to where, oh, that makes sense, and I'm going to be in line for that. But then the third thing is just the crash of the money system, which we're on the verge of just the, the craziness of our world now, the crash of the dollar. We experienced some of that when 9-11 came and the, the economic fallout that we experienced through something like that. We see the rise of Bitcoin, digital money in our, in our nation right now. And I truly believe that one of the catastrophic things that will shake the world like nothing before will be the rapture. And you say, how will the world go through the rapture and not, not be like, what in the world's going on? Man, Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and the life, and I missed out on it. You know, if you're asking that question, I hope you come back next week because we're going to get into all that because the Bible addresses so many of those things, and we're just going to get into that. But all of this is just science. The, the, the great falling away, the, the advancement of sin, the advancement of how God uses or how the devil is using technology, all of these things. But you think about what does a sign do? A sign points to something. A sign is to make you aware of something. A sign is for you to bring something to your attention if you're driving down the road. And I hope you do. Read signs when you're driving. I do that all the time. I'll be like, man, I missed my exit because they didn't put a sign out. And Jenny will tell me, you, you, there was two signs. You weren't reading the signs. You know, sometimes we can be like that as Christians. We're going and we're like, oh, we're so caught off God. And God said, I filled the Bible full of signs. Signs are to give you direction. Signs are to inform you. Signs are to make you aware. Are we doing that? Signs are to tell you how close we are and what comes next. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man come. The one thing that I do know is we're sitting there going, ah, 
probably not. Oh, I've heard this, whatever. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. 